Edgeworks Nebula. Hey folks, this is Lacey Hannon. Long before modern advancements in astronomy allowed us to learn about the chemical compositions of stars and just how far they are from Earth, ancient humans were forming meaning out of the twinkling lights they found consistently arranged in the night skies. Some of these lights shined brighter than others, and some appeared to combine into familiar images. As we often do as a species inclined towards storytelling, our ancestors built characters and stories out of the patterns they found in the stars. The night sky became the biggest and most widely available book on the planet, and the stories within it were what we recognize today as the constellations. Apart from the sun or the moon, and a few planets if you know where to look, the nearest and brightest stars are a rare part of space that we can regularly observe from Earth without the aid of a telescope. They accompany us on every clear night wherever we are, and at some point during any given year, you'll be able to spot all 88 constellations. More than half of these were named and recorded by the ancient Greeks, drawing upon earlier discoveries that had been made in Babylonia, Egypt, and Assyria. The constellations have some fascinating stories to tell us today, both in terms of where we've been as a human race and in terms of where the universe is going. In this new series, we're going to deep dive into the astronomical facts and age-old mythologies behind some of the most famous constellations, potentially giving you a whole new perspective the next time you look up at a starry night. Today, we'll be looking southwest for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, and northwest for those below the equator to find one of the largest and brightest of all constellations, and surely the most famous, Orion the Hunter. If you're new to constellation spotting, Orion is the perfect place to start, provided you're looking during the constellation's highest visibility months of January through April. The three stars that make up Orion's belt provide stargazers an easy way of identifying the constellation. Their even spacing and brilliant glow draw the eye and make for one timeless celestial fashion statement. Once you've found Orion's belt, you can easily trace the hunter's figure down to the two stars that comprise his feet or up to where another two stars form the left and right shoulders, while a third less prominent star serves as the head. Several less brilliant stars make up the club that's raised in Orion's right hand while some see the skin of a lion, a shield, or perhaps even a bow held out before him. Despite his readied stance, Orion has not to date caught either Lepus the rabbit or Taurus the bull, both constellations that are situated nearby. But considering his waistline has been gradually expanding over the millennia and will continue to do so, he can't be too shabby of a hunter. While there are obviously several stars that contribute to the overall impression of Orion the Hunter, only 10 are formally named. The seven brightest of which are considered to be the constellation's major stars. The three least luminous of Orion's 10 named stars are Tabit, a yellow-white dwarf star positioned high on the lion's skin held up in his left hand, Hatissa, a blue giant star found on the lower half of the figure's tunic, and Mesa, another blue giant which sits where Orion's head would be. Of the three, Hatissa is the brightest. But when people talk about the stars of Orion, they're usually referring to one of the big seven, and they are indeed some of the most impressive stars to be found in the night sky. Let's start with a look at that iconic three-star belt. In order from left to right, you'll find al Nitak, al Niram, and min -taka which all means something very similar in Arabic. al nitak means girdle, al nilam is derived from the phrase meaning string of pearls, and mintaka naturally means belt. All three are blue-white supergiants, each a good deal larger and several thousand times brighter than our sun. Despite being the farthest of the three from Earth at a distance of 1300 light years, the center star, al nilam is the brightest part of the belt and the fourth brightest star in Orion. As mentioned, 
Orion's belt has been gradually and imperceptibly widening over time. All Nilam is actually moving both away from us and sideways at a speed of 58,000 miles per hour. While that might get you noticed in the fast lane here on Earth, that's actually pretty slow when it comes to objects moving through the expanse of space. And Alnitak and Mintaka are virtual tortoises moving at speeds of around 41,000 miles per hour. It will take a very long time for anyone to notice a change in Orion's appearance. Several thousand years from now, however far Alnilam moves away from us, that bright center buckle will hardly appear to have lost its luster. Moving up to Orion's shoulders, we find the second and third brightest stars of the constellation, which incidentally have both lent their names to a couple of spooky characters in popular fiction. Orion's third brightest star, which makes up his left shoulder, was the inspiration for Voldemort's most loyal follower, that unhinged and sadistic dark witch Bellatrix Lestrange, who was played with twisted delight by Helena Bonham Carter in the Harry Potter films. Bellatrix is a blue-white dwarf star well on its way to becoming a giant. Its name is Latin for female warrior, and it has sometimes been called the Amazon Star for the fierce female warriors of Greek mythology. For a time, it was thought Orion's left shoulder may have come from the same place of birth as the three stars in his belt, but we now know Bellatrix to be too close to the Earth for that. In fact, it's the closest of Orion's major stars at a distance of 244 light years, still a far cry from our very closest star neighbor, Proxima Centauri, which is a comparative hop, skip, and a jump at a distance of just four light years. Opposite Bellatrix on Orion's right shoulder, you'll find a red supergiant that goes by the perfectly inconspicuous name of Beetlejuice. Yes, you heard that correctly. No, I'm not summoning a wacky ghost from a Tim Burton movie, and no, I'm not going to repeat it three times just because you want to see what would happen if I do. It's anyone's guess why Tim Burton's screenwriters named the ghost with the most after Orion's right shoulder. But sharp-eyed fans of the movie will notice that the character's name is actually spelled in the film just like the stars. That's B-E-T-E-L-G-U-E-S-E -E -E for all you listening in. The spelling was changed for the film's title because it looks funnier written as a compound of beetle and juice, and because everyone probably would have mispronounced the actual spelling as Betel guys anyway. The star's name is actually a mispronunciation of an Arabic term meaning armpit of the giant, which in a weird way feels entirely appropriate for Michael Keaton's head-spinning poltergeist. But unintentionally, silly name aside, Betelgeuse is actually a pretty fascinating star in its own right. It's by far the biggest star in Orion, fluctuating anywhere from 700 to 1,000 times the size of our sun. For a frame of reference, if Betelgeuse was in the sun's position, it would extend past where Jupiter currently orbits. That's a big star. As you might expect of an object of that magnitude, Betelgeuse is the 10th brightest star in our night sky. Though much younger than the sun, a mere 10 million years of age by comparison with the 4.5 billion years the sun's been around, Betelgeuse is expected to go supernova within the next 100,000 years. While the sun is not yet halfway through its lifetime, in 2020 there was a bit of false alarm for the astronomy community when Betelgeuse rapidly dimmed, prompting speculation that the supergiant had collapsed and would soon unleash a brilliant explosion. Turns out, the star was just letting out a little gas, which formed into a dark cloud that momentarily obscured it from Earth. Classic Betelgeuse. When it does eventually go supernova, the star will glow as brightly as a full moon, day and night, for anywhere from a few weeks to a few months before it goes dark forever, leaving Orion without a right shoulder. The Wynn Hannon household is a HelloFresh devotee. As a mom and CEO, I do not have a lot of extra time on my hands to consider grocery shopping and what healthy meal plans are going to work for our multi-generational family. HelloFresh keeps me from decision fatigue by delivering fresh, quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week. Plus, you can cut back time spent in the kitchen with meals ready in around 30 minutes or less. 
Suddenly, farm to table is as available to you as it is to any fancy restaurant, especially when you have seasonal and summery flavors like cucumber salad stuffed pita pockets, chicken sausage stuffed peppers, Tuscan spiced shrimp, and so much more. Join us in our HelloFresh appreciation. Go to HelloFresh.com slash STS16 and use code STS16, that's one six, for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash STS16 for 16 free meals and up to three free gifts with code STS16. But even once that bright supergiant disappears, Orion will still have its very brightest star, Rigel, which we recognize as the hunter's left foot. Rigel, whose name is aptly derived from the Arabic for left leg of the giant, is a supergiant like Betelgeuse. Unlike Betelgeuse, Rigel is in the prime of its life as a star and still has a few million years to go before its own core collapses. Burning blue-white, Rigel is extremely hot, with temperatures reaching more than twice those of the sun. The star casts off immense amounts of ultraviolet radiation, making it a very unsuitable candidate for playing host to a habitable planet, but a very lovely star in our night sky. It's the seventh brightest of all the stars viewed from Earth. The last of Orion's major stars, Seyef, which gives the hunter his right foot, is another blue-white supergiant. Seif is actually far hotter than Rigel, and about four and a half times the temperature of the sun. But because so much of the light it produces is ultraviolet and therefore invisible, it's just the sixth brightest star in the constellation, outshining only Mintica of Orion's major stars. Seif has already used up the hydrogen in its core and will eventually turn into a red supergiant like Betelgeuse on its journey towards supernova. But as with Rigel, that thankfully won't be happening anytime soon, and people will be able to enjoy the full portrait of Orion in the night sky for a long time to come. While you'd think there's a reasonable chance Seif might mean right leg of giant given the pretty straightforward naming of most of Orion's other major stars, the name actually comes from an Arab sword that dates back to before the 7th century. The name Seif was originally given to another of Orion's features which we haven't discussed yet, and somewhere along the line mistakenly wound up as the name for Orion's right foot. That other feature we've yet to discuss is of course Orion's sword. There's more than just stars that make up the overall impression of Orion in the night sky. Parts of the image are formed by nebulas, clouds of dust and gas that sometimes form from dying stars, and that sometimes give birth to new stars themselves. The most famous of Orion's nebulas is Messier 42, aka the Orion Nebula. It's situated on the lower half of Orion's tunic between two unnamed stars. Together, the three glowing points form a diagonal line that look like a scabbard angling downward from Orion's belt, thus providing the hunter his sword. The Orion Nebula is one of the most photographed and most studied of all nebulas. Like the rest of Orion, it's bright enough and large enough to be seen without the aid of a telescope on a clear night at the right time of year. The ancient Maya were so impressed by the nebula, they made it the literal center of their creation myth. The Maya believed the three stars that form a triangle around the Orion nebula, Orion's two feet, Rigel, and Seif, and the center belt star, Alnilum, were three stones that kindled the flames of a celestial hearth from which emerged the deity of the sun to offer itself as an enduring sacrifice, giving its energy every day so that the earth can live. For the Maya, the smoky Orion Nebula was the great hearth itself. The really crazy part about this creation myth is that the Orion Nebula actually does give birth to new stars. The nebula is just one part of the greater Orion molecular cloud complex, which spans hundreds of light years across and serves as a vast nursery for new stars. More than 3,000 young stars have formed here over the past million years. Some are even surrounded by the makings of planets, though not all will survive their stars' tempestuous growing pains. One day, the fledgling stars of the Orion complex will form their own solar systems, just as ours was formed some four and a half billion years ago. The Maya, of course, weren't the only culture to project their stories onto the stars of Orion. 
the ancient Egyptians were pretty fascinated by what went on in the night sky too. Some believe that the south shaft of the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza pointed toward Orion's belt during the time of its construction. There is also a theory that the three pyramids of Giza may themselves have represented the three stars in Orion's belt. According to the pyramid texts, early writings found on the walls of the pyramids, the Egyptians envisioned the god Sa in Orion's stars. Their view of Sa, however, involved a much larger image than the constellation of Orion. Betelgeuse represented the tip of Sa's headjet, that's the tall crown you see worn by Egyptian pharaohs and deities, and the figure extended downward from there to include the constellation Lepus. In later texts, such as the Book of the Dead, Sa became associated with Osiris, the god of the underworld, who had risen in popularity by then. It was believed that upon the pharaoh's death, he would journey to Orion's stars to enter the afterlife. For the Babylonians, Orion represented the true shepherd of Anu, who was basically the god of all gods. The figure of Anu is shaped similarly to the classic depiction of Orion the hunter, only the Babylonian's deity holds a shepherd's staff instead of a club. For the Navajo of the American Southwest, the stars of Orion represent a young warrior referred to as First Slender One, who protects the Navajo with his bow and arrow. As was the case for many early cultures, the consistent changes in the visibility of the constellations throughout the year was an important factor in the Navajo's ability to track the seasons. When the first slender one would fade from the sky in May, they knew it was time to plant their crops. For the Chinook of the Pacific Northwest, Orion's sword and Orion's belt are two canoes competing to catch a fish that is represented by nearby Sirius. The Cree of Canada see Orion as the good-natured trickster and sometimes shapeshifter Wisa Kichok. And for early Hawaiians, the hourglass shape of Orion's body became the popular string puzzle game known as Cat's Cradle. But of course, the ancient Greeks, powerhouse of a civilization that they were, named all the known constellations after their favorite gods and monsters and documented them in Ptolemy's astronomical treatise the Almagest to be handed down through time to the International Astronomical Union, which today officially recognizes the constellations by the names and illustrations the Greeks came up with. Maybe it was a consolation for the fact that the Romans got almost all of the planets. The Greeks absolutely loved coming up with stories about their gods. So much so, they sometimes came up with multiple stories to explain certain gods' origins or why any given god wanted to punish another by asking Zeus or Hera to turn them into an animal for them. It was basically the multiverse before the multiverse was a thing. So there are a few different stories concerning Orion and how he found his place among the stars. Early accounts see Orion as the son of Poseidon and Euryle, the second eldest of the snake-haired Gorgon sisters. While later accounts suggest he was basically fermented in a jar in the ground, wrapped in a bull hide, when King Hyrius showed hospitality to Zeus and Hermes and was granted his wish for a son in return. Either way, he probably didn't have a typical upbringing. Accounts also vary when it comes to Orion's demise and how he ended up as a constellation. In one version, being full of hubris, which was pretty par for the course for the pantheon of Greek gods, Orion announced he was going to hunt every last animal on Earth, which sounds excessive, but it is good to have goals and to aim high. Gaia, Mother Earth, caught wind of this and was like, you're going to do what now? Preferring not to see the Earth deprived of all animals, Gaia turned the tables on Orion and sent an animal after him. There are any number of animals she could have chosen. A lion would have worked, maybe an angry centaur. But Gaia really wanted to make a statement, so she made it a giant scorpion. Which does sound like just about the most terrifying thing you could be chased by. Though a terrific hunter, Orion was no match for the scorpion, and he fell to its lethal tail. Other accounts see Orion entangled with the goddess of the hunt, Artemis, who was known for turning down potential suitors either politely or with bow and arrow. In some versions, Orion is slain outright when he either pursues one of Artemis' maidens or the goddess herself. In others, however, the two fall in love and Artemis' disapproving twin brother Apollo tricks her into slaying Orion with an arrow while he swims in a lake too far away for her to see it's him she's targeting. 
In yet another version, Orion is abducted to an island by Eos, goddess of the dawn, who has developed a scary, intense crush on him, and Artemis snipes Orion with an arrow in a case of, if I can't have him, nobody will. You have to imagine in his dying moment, Orion wondering why she didn't just shoot Eos. Orion's life is basically a choose-your-own-adventure book. Only whichever route you take, Orion can never escape the hand of fate. His placement in the sky favors his run-in with Gaia, though, since she ensured the scorpion that killed him would itself become a constellation as a reward for its bravery. Even for a giant scorpion, taking on the greatest hunter who ever lived is a pretty daring move. It is perhaps of some relief to Orion that of all the combinations of starry figures that can be found throughout the year, Orion and Scorpius never occupy the sky together. Whether birthing new stars, paying tribute to an unlucky in love demigod, or prompting giggles over the name of a star that's been hijacked by Tim Burton, the constellation Orion is one heck of a conversation starter. Even without the stories to heighten its cool, it remains one of the most remarkable sights in the night sky. So look for the telltale triple stars the next time winter rolls around and enjoy one of our galaxy's coolest constellations for yourself. Until next time, happy terraforming. Be sure to leave a review and tell your friends about Settle the Stars. Every review really helps for an indie show like ours. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Settle the Stars is available on pretty much every podcasting platform, and we're also mirroring our episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworksentertainment. And be sure to ring that bell so you know when there's a new episode. We also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash edgeworksentertainment. The support of listeners like you is what makes this show possible, and I am so grateful to the people who have already joined. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edgeworks Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edgeworks Entertainment. Edgeworks Nebula.